and welcome back to another episode of DNA Live. My name is Jeff Wright. We're so happy to be coming to you today. If you're visiting us for the first time, or if you're a regular, please say hello in the comments. Let us know where you're watching from. Uh, please like and share this video. Help us spread the word, uh, biblical worldview, what it's about, how to apply it. Today we have a very special guest who is going to talk about uh, vocational training and the application of biblical worldview. But before I get to that, we have a big announcement in the office this week. Uh, Scott Allen's new book, Why Social Justice is Not Biblical Justice, is out. Uh, it's available on Amazon. Since it's come out, it's been the number one new release on Amazon under uh, Christianity, I believe, is the, uh, is the title or the, the category. Uh, it's available on uh, Kindle e-reader. It's available in paperback. And we'll have an audio book out sometime soon. Not sure the timeline on that, but please check it out. If you want to find out more about what the Disciple Nations Alliance is doing uh, in the United States and around the world, you can visit disciplenations.org. And there's plenty of resources there to help uh, equip you with uh, understanding worldview, applying worldview, equipping others with a biblical worldview. And our uh, flagship tool to do that is called Quorum Deo. It's a free online biblical worldview course. It's available at quorumdeo.com. I believe our friend Sean Carson is behind the scenes. He'll be linking some of these things in the comments. We encourage you to sign up for Quorum Deo. You can take it in a group. You can take it uh, at your own pace. It's free. It's available to you. We want you to use it as a resource. We hope it blesses you. So without further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce our guest, Dr. Amanda Forbes. She is a co-founder and director of Trinity Education, an international education nonprofit. Trinity works in Africa, Asia, Europe, and the Caribbean and provides training for leaders to start their own vocational training programs for youth in their communities. Biblical worldview training is incorporated into Trinity's programs and is the central part of what Trinity does. Can you believe I memorized all of that? Amazing. Amanda, please come in and join us. How are you? Very good. Very impressive introduction, Jeff. Ah, I can't believe you memorized all that. That's cool. Off the top of my head. So good. Amanda, thank you so much. Uh, I'm excited to have you on here because I believe I called you out in a, a sign off maybe a month and a half ago. I just, I just saw who was in the audience, who had commented, and I said, we're going to have some of you people on, and I believe I mentioned your name. Um, we've never, we've actually never met. We met 10 minutes ago, right? I don't, I don't think we've ever. I think you led before. worship for an event last year. Okay, in so you were there. Yeah, yeah, right. But we didn't really meet. You no, right. You led us in worship, which was great. Passing ships, right. So, uh, yeah, this is the first time we're going to get to know each other a little bit. Well, I asked the question, so I'll get to know you a little bit, and so will our audience. But I'm excited. Uh, as I, I came on the team almost three years ago now, two and a half plus years ago, and so there's just a lot of drinking from the fire hose and catching up and putting names and places and faces all together, and Trinity Education just pops up and pops up and pops up, and uh uh, everyone here in the office is definitely a fan of you and your work. And so we really appreciate what you're doing. Um, well, likewise, we love the DNA and couldn't awesome. do what we're doing without you all. So it's really an honor and a joy to work with you guys. Thank you. Yeah. So we, um, I, I would love if you would share a little bit about yourself personally, maybe your, your upbringing, uh, faith sure. journey, and then maybe we'll transition that into more specifically about Trinity. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, well, I am the oldest of eight kids, so grew up in a very vibrant uh, Christian home, was very fortunate to be introduced to the Lord at an early age, and um, was very, very blessed to have a lot of really good discipleship tools that God brought into my life from an early age. I grew up with like Awana and Bible summer camps, and a lot of EBS, and really good um, like youth groups in mm -hmm. church, and just mm -hmm. really caring attentive, intentional the world were you in? um, mentors. So I grew up in, uh, born in Southern California, okay. spent most of my childhood in the Midwest in Illinois. Okay. And then, um, yeah, graduated from high school in New York, Florida. And then, uh, yeah, went to college in a couple different parts of the country. So I've lived all over, but it's, uh, yeah, it's been fun getting to know different parts of the U.S. So. Nice. 
yeah, so homeschooling was a big part of my story. And obviously, my, my parents were very big on incorporating a lot of um, Christian worldview and discipleship um, materials into that process. So I feel really, really thankful for just a lot of good books and, and teaching that I was exposed to young. And then I got into my head uh, that I wanted to finish high school early and that I could um, fit everything in and graduate by age 15. And so I met that goal and went off to college oh. right after my 16th birthday. And I was a music education major. Piano was a big part of my life. So I had a lot of fun four years getting to practice a lot and perform and just really love that. And still is a big part of my life today. I help awesome. um, lead worship occasionally at our church and play keyboard and all that. So yeah, I was um, music ed. And then after I, I graduated, I went to Pepperdine University, finished my degree there. And then a couple weeks later, my, my family moved me to Nashville, Tennessee. And I started at Vanderbilt University for an elementary education degree. Okay. And I guess that came from I'd already always had a heart for kind of like international missions, development sort of work, and just really felt like, yeah, I love kids. I grew up in a large family. Teaching is something that would be a good tool um, internationally and on the mission field. Yeah, so yeah. Pursued that. And while I was at Vanderbilt, I just kind of got a stirring that um, maybe the Lord would have me go do more education. And so I applied to some PhD programs while I was finishing my master's and um, got accepted to a few of them and decided to go to the University of Minnesota um, up in the tundra. But I wanted to go because I was a big fan of John Piper and wanted to be part of a very... And gophers. Not, not a fan of the gophers. Oh, okay. I, was, I was a fan of... Um, I guess being part of a very missions-minded yeah, church, and they yeah. sent a lot of missionaries overseas and got to know a ton of um, just amazing individuals and families with a heart for missions. So I loved my time there and uh, finished. The degree was kind of an aside <laughs> while I was there. It was more focused on a lot of missions and church stuff. But um, yeah, I did finish with a, a PhD in international development and education. And then um, shortly after that, I met Vishal, Mangawadi, who many people um, watching probably know and follow his work. And he was a friend of my roommate from Pepperdine. So many years back, I had never met Vishal. I just heard about him from my old college roommate. And um, I had a heart for India, did my dissertation on India and education. And so I, I had just kind of been encouraged, like, you should talk to him. He might have some kind of guidance for your next steps. So I think I found his phone number on his website and just randomly called. I think it was his wife, Ruth, who answered and we set up a time to, to meet. I was in Georgia, I think at the time in the Atlanta area, but had a trip out to California and got to meet them. And he told me about Trinity Education, which I, I now direct at that point. It was just an idea that a couple people, Bob Moffitt, um, a few other um, friends of, of Bob and Vishal's were interested in getting started. So um, yeah, I, I love the vision. I was freshly out of graduate school. I'm kind of looking for the next thing God had for my life. And um, yeah, I kind of got to take up the mantle of leadership. And almost nine years later, here we are. Here we are. Wow. Well, that's, that is a great summary. Do you think uh, wanting to graduate high school by the age of 15 had anything to do with being the oldest of eight in a homeschool family? <laughs> how, how many kids were you teaching by that time? I don't know. <laughs> it, Possibly. Kind of... my, my parents definitely, yeah, encouraged us to be ambitious and yeah, yeah. have a lot of responsibility. So good. Yeah, that was just part of my psyche at that time. And then I think we'll unpack this a little bit later, but what I heard, um, which is inspiring to me as, as a father for um, an overnight homeschooler because everyone in the world became an overnight homeschooler. Um, mm -hmm. But ha with my mind being in that space for a long time, just not, you know, this is the push we needed. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of late to the party uh, in, in the biblical worldview conversation. You know, I, I'm very blessed by my time I've had here at DNA uh, and it's, it's helped me tremendously, but I, I'm inspired when I hear how you grew up with it just being a part of the way your parents did things, you know, and that's, 
that's pretty neat. I think uh, Arturo Cuba, who's been a guest of ours, says uh, the disciplines that we have are just second nature to our children. If, and so I, 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 I don't know how that plays into your story, but I hear that. And from, yeah. a, from a young yeah. age, education and worldview, we're already... Yeah, and I, that, that's a very profound insight. And just to piggyback on that, I wouldn't say that there's anything that stands out to me from my years of homeschooling, like that book was rock solid or that curriculum mm -hmm. changed my, my thinking about the world and really gave me a, a biblical perspective on things. It wasn't content, it wasn't curriculum, it wasn't books or resources. Those are important and I think as I got older, um, you know, I was able to kind of look back and see like, yeah, that was really pivotal. That was really influential. But as a child, I would say it was two things. Number one, exactly what you're talking about, just having parents who lived out, um, you know, an active, vibrant relationship with the Lord and who I could talk to, you know, about highs and lows and where I was struggling, especially in terms of faith and not always like existential doubts or crises, but mm -hmm. just like, I don't understand what God is doing right now. I don't understand this disappointment or this rejection or things in mm -hmm. childhood that, you know, you look back on, it's like, that wasn't a big deal that I didn't yeah. get, you know, that role in the, the school play or whatever. But, you know, at the time, those are really, I think, formative places where kids um, just like worldview and relationship with God is shaped. And my parents really seized those opportunities to speak yeah. into my life and help me go to the Lord. But those things, so I'm really thankful for that. And then number two, I would say just like knowing, being in the word and memorizing it a lot through programs like Awana. And um, yeah, sometimes my parents would do things like, if you memorize this chapter of the Bible, we'll take you to an amusement park or, mm. you know, fun things like that. And that doesn't always work. But um, I just, I had a lot of scripture from an early age that was encouraged um, just in terms of memorization. And I'm so thankful for that as an adult. Yeah. because it, it's still there yeah. and yeah. That, that was such a gift and a foundation bribe kids to memorize bible okay got okay. it good <laughs> i'm taking these notes home to my wife not what i meant <laughs> uh, no i hear it i i still i still have the sparks awana song memorized yeah. yes yeah. Okay. um awesome so you mentioned trinity nine years in now but take us back uh fill in the picture a little bit about what Trinity is, um, yeah. you know, and maybe if it was something different to start, you can start there and then we'll kind of fill in what changed in the journey and what it is now. Definitely. Okay. So I would say where we started is probably where everyone watching this involved in some facet of ministry. I think we all share the same burning desire, just, you know, Habakkuk, to like that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Mm -hmm. I just remember that being kind of a rallying cry or anthem for us at the beginning. And that's, that's broad, but our specific kind of orientation to that, I guess, was we felt like with the experience, with the knowledge, with the people on our team, that we could build something around higher education being distributed through the local church with the help of technology and all the online resources that were coming out during that time. Um, but then the most important part being that local person who could be a mentor and disciple maker for the students. And there were a couple of things going on around that time. So we started in 2012 and people called that the year of the MOOC and the MOOC stands for the massive open online courses that a ton of universities were putting yeah, out. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So we were kind of riding that wave of, wow, there's all this free curriculum from the best institutions in the world coming out. And anybody with an internet connection can access that. Was so we, this just another MOOC just now? Did we have a mini MOOC with the quarantine and everyone kind of opening? Thing, or it, what? Or it everybody? feels like, yeah, and we can, we can talk about that maybe okay. later. But no, th this has been kind of like the promise that we saw in 2012 that never really materialized. Uh, okay, yeah, happened. yeah. Because things really didn't take off the way people thought back in 2000. But everyone was offering it. Everyone was offering and it. it just, okay. The problem was, though, people thought you put it out there, they'll come, they'll benefit from it, mm -hmm. they'll make a better life for themselves. The completion rate for those MOOCs was so low, like, mm -hmm. I think around 5%. Okay. And so you really didn't have people finishing the courses. 
the people who did were more educated already. So it's like, let me add one more, you know, credential to my resume as opposed to the people who really, um, you know, need education and their whole life could be changed by it. So, right. so yeah, we were looking at, okay, you have all these MOOCs mm -hmm. and online courses, but they don't really provide any impact or change unless you combine it with something local, something more holistic and something with guidance and mentoring because a lot of students just don't finish if they're given an online course. So you know, you're, you could be projecting it from California. I mean, that's, that's where your servers are sitting. That's where your office is or whatever. But, but if you don't have something on the ground in mm -hmm. the country, then it's, yes. it doesn't make sense. Okay. Yes. And it was really interesting because within the first few years that we started, we were able to talk to some different organizations that were using those MOOCs, but then they would set up a campus in like Kigali, Rwanda, um, Coursera, one of the big MOOC providers mm -hmm. was setting up um, like learning communities in different, I think, major cities so that students could have that in-person interaction. So it was like all these, you know, non-Christian thinkers and educators were recognizing the same thing that we were trying to encourage that you need the community support, you need the guidance, you need the accountability for these to really work. And so we were just trying to do that, but from uh, the perspective of we can also make disciples mm -hmm. as we're bringing, you know, skills and knowledge that the students wouldn't access otherwise. Yeah. So I, I hear the, where you say that some people are taking it just for the certificate, but other people are taking it because the knowledge they would gain from it is uh it just mm -hmm. on the other side of that it all it looks so different but it, it is uh, we because our our course is online you know we do quorum deo now and we see that yeah. right it's 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 not the checklist it's not uh the watching of the video it's the understanding the gaining of this knowledge that and the mm -hmm. application of it that will in the really, application exactly right? yeah exactly so we really tried to build out this heart heads hand model so we would take the free curriculum online but then we would add things that were more practical and service oriented in terms of assignments that they'd be graded for so that they were actually doing things to bless their local community and then they'd have you know a pastor or a teacher whoever was their mentor doing things like quorum deo and discussions and the discipline of love application with the students so we just tried to make it more holistic not just here's the free online course go yeah. So timeline wise, your, your initial goals were, Hey, the knowledge is in here. If they want to come get it, mm -hmm. open it to them. Doesn't hit as well as you expect. So then yeah. how, how long did it take you in that first iteration to kind of figure out the on the ground? Yeah. Are you a, two so, years in now or? Yeah. So we did our first pilot in 2014. We did it with, um, a group, Sheep Care Community Center in Soweto um, area in Nairobi, Kenya. Okay. And um, it, was, it was a really great opportunity to see the, the hunger of the students for learning. And we did more kind of technology, coding sorts of things with some of the students. And then Quorum Deo was really impactful for them. So that was our first pilot. And then we started a second one in 2015 with uh, Misha Koduke in Nairobi as well. And um, yeah, I kind of did a similar sort of approach with his students. And then in 2016, we started growing a lot more at that point. We worked with a church in Peru um, that I believe is part of the DNA network. And we worked with a group in Tanzania. So we were seeing some really good, encouraging growth, having several new, um, yeah, different locations and new partners coming in. But we hit a couple of roadblocks. So Number one, our, our vision from the beginning was really to equip and empower the church with this new sort of vision for reaching young people in their communities through mm -hmm. education. And if you've read anything from, from Vishal Mangalwadi, he talks a lot about how the church from the beginning was very integral in higher education and providing university education. And so that was our vision was to kind of reintegrate the church with higher education and provide a model that was accessible to students in some of the least third parts of the world. Um, and a couple years in and having more partners who weren't churches, but were secondary schools or, um, yeah, just kind of more of a community oriented program. We, we realized that our model wasn't really, I guess, hitting the need for the churches or, 
you know, it, it was easy. And I, I look back and realize this is where I was at fault, but to blame the churches, like, oh, they don't have the vision. They don't care about higher education. But I think there's also an aspect where we were asking them to take on something very heavy and massive mm-hmm. in terms of mm-hmm. we're kind of starting a micro campus, yeah. a micro college campus. And that, that's a lot to ask of any church that's, you know, just struggling to survive day to day. And so we realized we needed to pull back and broaden our approach to say, okay, we're not just working with churches, but we'll work with Christian schools, we'll work with NGOs, we'll work with community leaders, anyone who has, you know, a vision to impact the youth in their community through practical vocational training and Christian worldview. And once we did that, we saw a lot more growth in terms of who we could work with. And what's neat is we still do have some churches we yeah. work with, but often they're churches that already have a school or even a university. So their vision was already there Yeah, yeah. because we tried from the beginning to be the vision casters. And I remember speaking at a very large church conference in Nigeria early on and, you know, trying to mobilize the ministry leaders to do this. And, um, and we weren't successful in, hmm. in casting that vision. We were more successful in working with people who had the vision for education already, and then adding something new to their toolbox that they could offer this program to reach, yeah, a new demographic of students that they wouldn't otherwise be able to. So do you have to tailor it uh, to fit in different contexts or is it pretty cookie cutter? I mean, how does that? Yeah, yeah. So initially we were very structured and regimented Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this this is what the program is these are the standards these are the requirements and of course like naturally so over the years we've become a lot more contextualized and that's really one of the greatest joys i have is being able to get to know our partners kind of listen to what are you already doing what what kind of vision or heart has god given you for the community you're working in and then be able to figure out how to resource them whether that's the programs you already have, we have around five or so right now that we can offer. Okay. Um, or, you know, I just enjoy like, you know, here's some pieces of things that we're using in terms of technology strategies, good courseware you can use and kind of letting them go and figure out what makes sense for them and in their context. And yeah. so in that regard, I almost wonder if the next chapter of Trinity will look more like maybe a consulting arm or wing where where we are um, more like a repository where we can offer different strategies or curricula or approaches depending on the needs of of that partner. Yeah. I'll give you an example. We work with Meshach Odiki in Kenya and we'd offered kind of the same program web design um, with uh, biblical worldview integrated into it. And he's worked with us for years and then COVID hit. And nobody could come to his campus. The mm-hmm. students access the computers at his school facilities. And so he very quickly pivoted to say, we're going to design online curriculum. And we're going to focus on um, 12th graders who need to take the Kenyan national exams. And we're going to provide them with, yes, some content that they can do to prepare for those exams to study from home when they can't come into school. So we got to work with him creating like kind of a conceptual framework for how to design that curriculum and Um, He was able to get a small grant and he's been developing online content for his school. And I'm really excited to see what that looks like. And that's not something that Trinity offers, but we've designed online content and curriculum for years. So we could coach him and how to develop that for his purposes. Wow. Yeah. I heard, I don't know how much insight you're going to have, but that Kenya is, they're just going to do a wash on the whole year pretty much for a lot of the under. Underclassmen, it, it right? It seems that way, yeah. yeah. Wow, that's they, tough. they might be saying that they're trying to do things. I know they have like some radio programming mm-hmm. and yeah. whatnot, but it does feel like a wash. Yeah. So, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts? And I, I think this is kind of a, I know where I would take this from, from the DNA uh, rhetoric that we have about the sacred secular divide. But do you, you talked about how, um, you were trying to provide this university level uh, program to churches and it just wasn't taking off. Um, yet, if you look at all of the great universities, they were all founded by Christians and churches. And then hundreds of years later, that's just, it's almost nobody 
is teaching at that high a level in, in the Christian faith? Do you, what, what is that about? Oh, man. Well, I really appreciate George Marsden. He's a professor emeritus from Notre Dame, I think. And uh, he's written a lot about the history of, at least in the U.S., Christian higher education, how it all started out as some sort of seminary, theological mm -hmm. training institute, Yale, Princeton, Harvard, and then the evolution. A lot of it just relates to worldview perspectives and how things changed a lot around um, the late 1800s and then with the two world wars in the 1900s and just a lot of different liberal ideas that entered in and have left us, yeah. you know, where we're at today, where there's so much hostility towards higher education. But I would really recommend reading um, his work. And there's a great article. He has a, a really lengthy book, but also a summarized article that I'd love to share. Maybe you could post okay. in the comments or wherever. But he's, yeah. he's the best thinker I found in kind of that history of how did we change so much. But the short of it is it's, it's just been the evolution of ideas. And yeah. as the DNA says, like, you know, ideas have consequences, right. and bad ideas have bad consequences. And yeah. And uh, right. And at some point, uh, theology became this category instead of this understanding of this comprehensive worldview that exactly everything yeah. is under this umbrella. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Uh, do you know the name of the article? And I'll have someone look it up in the background while we yeah, it's on First Things, okay. the journal. So someone Google that with George Marsden, I'm sure they'd find it. Sean's on it. Okay, Thank sounds you. good. Would you, and we'll move forward again, but would you unpack heart, head, and hands a little bit for me? Yeah. I know about the 4-H club. I don't know about the 3-H club. <laughs> well, you know, that was a model we used early on, and we don't really talk that way anymore. Okay. But, um, yeah, so heart really is just the kind of affective love for the Lord and relational part of, yeah, we're created in his image and we're created to know him and to love him and to be in relationship with him. And so I'm just really wanting to cultivate that part of students' lives. And unfortunately, um, I feel like among the younger generation, and I can say this as someone who was homeschooled, grew up in church and Christian home and um, pretty much a Christian bubble. You know, we can focus so much on behavior and conformity and outward mm -hmm. um, kind of standards, but mm -hmm. miss, miss the heart and the relational part. And so we just really want Good for Lord. our students to have an active, vibrant relationship with the Lord. So heart kind of speaks to that aspect. And then head... When we started, we were very focused on liberal arts education and kind of redeeming Christian thought within a diversity of, of disciplines, you know, sciences and humanities. And we did things like, yeah, English composition and Western civilization and we had mathematics courses. And so we were really trying to be broad and kind of, yeah, that liberal arts approach to um, learning. And we found a couple of years in that that wasn't really hitting the mark for the population of students we were serving just because they didn't have time to come for three or four years to study all these subjects mm. they needed to be able to get employment and yeah, have income yeah. and be able to support themselves and their families and so we had to shift away from that and um i think it was totally appropriate because we weren't serving students who had the luxury of time and money yeah. and study those things but i hope that we've given them a hunger and a taste for study and using their mind in a different way and in our programs we've really tried to be intentional in incorporating critical thinking things that a lot mm. of times they've never really been asked to do yeah. you know in their k-12 education and so even if it's designing a website having them look at other examples and compare and contrast and develop rich content for their own website and i think those are really valuable things you know in terms of cultivating their critical thinking skills and their intellectual abilities that, yeah, they may have never been asked to use them in that way before. Mm. And then the hands part, um, that's just practical service um, or using what they have in their community. So, you know, we love if they build a website that they would maybe find a small business owner in their community or someone from their church or whatever, a relative who needs a website but that doesn't have one. And so it's practical, it's a real world 
project that they can apply their skills to and also relational too, because they're working with somebody in their own community. But probably the biggest thing for us has been discipline of love. We mm. just, we love that tool so much and it's been so good um, in almost all of our programs. We, we like to have that as an assignment. So they complete the discipline of love matrix. And then we ask them by the end, they don't need to complete the whole thing, but at least like three of the activities just to show that they're making a start and being intentional about those things. So that has been one of the greatest tools for us. Oh. And I think students, students really like it. Great. My, uh, my oldest is he'll be 10 next month and he's being homeschooled now mm -hmm. and he's, you know, he's so curious, um, always exploring, always investigating. And I, I kind of preached at him a little bit the other day saying, Hey son, this is it. I mean, you've got millions of kids that are just, they're never being taught to think they're just learning what they're supposed to repeat and welcome to the party, buddy. Now you're yeah. going to investigate. <laughs> you're going to think about things differently. You're going to learn how you want to learn. Yeah. And I think he got excited about it. I think he was, I think it was clicking a little bit. So. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think deep down, everybody wants to be pushed that way. Yeah. We might give you an attitude and be like, Oh, that's so much work, but we know we were created for more. And yeah. Yeah. I think that's what you find when you push students and challenge them a little bit more. Than yeah. Maybe. So, um, I know, you know, Ina Richards mm -hmm. and she shares when she does work for a living that, you know, a lot of times this promise of, uh, she doesn't, I mean, it's not advertised as a gospel sharing course. It's not advertised as, Hey, you know, come find Jesus and maybe you'll get a job. Right. It's, it's, this is employment training. Um, do you feel like, uh, what's, what's, what's the hook? What brings people in the door for you? Uh, is there an overtness to the fact that you are trying to make disciples as well? Uh, is it mostly Christians coming in because of the networks through which you work? You know, you said you started with, mm -hmm. uh, especially churches, but then ministries and, and Christian schools. And so is that, yeah. is that the, do they know? Yeah. What I th getting into for like exactly, a exactly. And I mean, I just have to pause for a second and say, Ina is amazing. I've visited her <coughs> centers and yeah, several times in South Africa. We've learned so much from her. I just, I can't praise her and work for a living and her team. I think Jamila and her staff is watching right now, but they have been amazing and they've been pivotal. I know. Hi, Jamila. Um, to our, are just thinking about how do we approach work in this area, especially if we're not gonna be a university, we're gonna do more vocational training. It's very much what Work for a Living does too. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've gained so much from working with them and still work with them right now in South Africa. Um, but yes, what's been interesting, and I, I hadn't really thought of it this way till you framed the question, but I think because we have over the years migrated from working with churches to now working with schools or NGOs or community leaders, um, our ability to reach students who probably wouldn't go inside a church has really expanded. And I think initially it was more, Amen. you know, Christian students from the church because the church was offering the program, but that's not really the case anymore. So yeah. we've had a program in Spain, actually. Um, I don't know if Anna's watching, but she introduced me to a partner there uh, last year in uh, Malaga. And they have been serving, I think, Muslim and non-Christian refugee students. So I don't think any of them are Christians, but they've, they've been able to offer the program to them. And it's been really exciting. So yeah, I think there's a, just a desire from our partner's perspective that these are valuable, employable skills that we can offer to the students. And you know, we want to, to welcome anybody who's interested in that. And then for the students, I think they, they do see the value in the sorts of things that they're learning because I know like in Rwanda where we've had programs, um, some of those students have college degrees from yeah. universities in Rwanda, but then, you know, they still want to come to our six week program because they haven't learned maybe some of the more cutting edge things about mm. technology and computer use. And uh, yeah, they go through our, our programs. So I think we're definitely able to reach a different target and demographic. Yeah. Well, so in a second, I want to get to how, you use worldview training in your six weeks, but I just want to point out 
right now how it's baked into how you're doing things, right? In that uh, it's this call to excellence. It's this call to steward, steward well. It's, it's this, uh, when the application of truth, when you apply truth, it bears good fruit, right? When, you, when you're seeking the truth and beauty and goodness of the kingdom, there are, there are good things that come from that, right? Absolutely. Uh, I had a pastor, uh, he was sharing with the group six months ago, and he, he's a sports fan, and he, he said, you know, Tim Tebow's done a lot of great things. Uh, Tim Tebow's football player, or former football player here in the United States, uh, phenomenal college player, and then didn't do so great in the NFL. And, and the pastor was asking, what's the best thing Tim Tebow could have done for, for the Lord? And he said he could have learned to throw a better spiral or something like that. You know, just that, yeah. just be the best at what you're doing. And uh, amen, sister. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, teach them. Teach. I love that, that they want to go to this course for the cutting edge stuff. You yeah. know, and, and there's so often we have uh, – and this is not to discount it, but, but we say, you know, my heart's in the right place. So everything else is going to fall, fall in line. Maybe could happen. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But there's, you know, there's some, some work in this. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I don't subscribe to that mentality at all. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good. So uh, tell us a little bit about how, uh, Quorum Deo is woven in how is it? So, I mean, it sounds like it is just in the DNA of the organization, but there's, are there marked times where you're using Quorum Deo? Are there, is it? Yeah. Is it, yeah. So um, I, I really do hope that what, what you just said is true, like that it is within our DNA because it's, I feel like it's very foundational to everything else we do and just our entire orientation to ministry and training and, you know, the ultimate ends that we want to see for this organization. So I, I think that's, that's there and that's our foundation. And then like Ina Richards does with work for a living, we have almost all of our facilitators go through Quorum Deo themselves. So we want it to become part of their DNA too. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, once they go through the course, Definitely, once they've taught it, like to their first class of students, they really catch the vision for mm -hmm. how important it is. And we have one facilitator in Haiti. Um, he's worked with us for a little while. He's outstanding. His name is Anderson. I think the DNA has written an article about him a little while back. But he has a computer science degree, um, mm -hmm. teaches at the Christian University in Port-au-Prince, like very sharp technically. And, you know, you would think a teacher like that would just – love to talk about computer science and coding and really emphasize that part, but that's not at all the case. He loves Quorum Deo and he loves to start with that. He loves to talk about it. He loves seeing the changes in the students. And it's really cool because he gets the integration between I'm a computer scientist, I'm a techie, but what Quorum Deo teaches me informs how I do all of that work. And mm -hmm. so he gets it. He models that to his students. And then he's able to weave that into their discussions. We encourage them to do like weekly Quorum Deo discussions with the students as part of the curriculum. And um, yeah, that's, that's really what, what we want to see in terms of how Quorum Deo is used. It's, it's there as a structured part of the curriculum. So each week they'll maybe do two Quorum Deo assignments. Um, we have a, a discussion that they do with their facilitator um, with Quorum Deo questions. Um, but yeah, I think it's more once it's in just the mindset and heart of that facilitator, it comes out in really unexpected ways. Yeah. And one of the things that we do um, in our training of facilitators is we like to do like a discussion role play with them to kind of get them practicing how to lead a quorum day discussion. But our real goal in those role plays is not like, you know, how facile are they as facilitators and how good are their questions? It's not about that. It's more, um, how are they thinking about contextualizing Quorum Deo within Nigeria, mm. within the Philippines, mm -hmm. within Uganda? Um, because we know that the issues are different in each of those right. places. And Quorum Deo is very universal and universally relevant, but it's also, it has so many nuanced applications that I would never think of. And so we're really presumed to, to 
to share. Right. That's yeah. we run yeah. into that all the time in our office. Yeah. So so that's something we really try to like instill in our facilitators when they're preparing to lead is how does this apply to what Nigeria is going through right now? Mm -hmm politically, economically, what the students are wrestling with, you know, social media things and, I don't know, bullying or gender issues. So, yeah, yeah that's been really exciting. And I'll say this, just one more thing. Our facilitator in Haiti, Anderson, who I mentioned, he's thinking about, I think this would be so great, um, kind of putting together like a, almost a repository of like, here's contextualizations for Haiti. Mm -hmm. And I would like to use that as a template for our other facilitators to come in and add well, here's the way that, you know, we use this to prompt discussions about things going on in Kenya or in South Africa. And eventually I would love the DNA to, you know, adopt something like that so that we could kind of see different ideas and learn from each other in different parts of the world. Amen. No, and if, if you are spreading seed, at some point there's more to harvest than you've ever sown, you know, mm -hmm. and, and we, we feel the same way, that there's just so many rich resources out there. Uh, one of the phrases we like to use is a sharing effective ministry models. Yeah. You know, yes. I know Dwight is salivating in the background watching this video right now. He's our VP. Oh, of, hi Dwight. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so let's see, Anderson, he loves seeing the changes in the students. You find the importance of, of plugging in corn. What are some of these changes you see? What are some of these aha moments we like to call them? Um, yeah. that, that are so pivotal to the success. Yeah. Well, the fun thing about Quorum Deo is they're so across the board. So, you know, I'll, I'll start with kind of, I think the biggest aha often for students is one of two things. So number one, the, the version of Christianity that they've been taught all their lives, that they've heard preached from their, their pulpit in their church, um, that they just kind of accepted without questioning, they realized like, oh, that's not as biblical as, as I thought. And, mm. you know, maybe there's more prosperity gospel interwoven in it. Maybe it's um, animism or other things. Mm -hmm. But I think that wake up for students just realizing that Christianity is quite different than what they've been taught in their entire lives. Mm. And I, I think that happens for facilitators as well as, as students. So yeah. that's that's number one. And then number two, kind of the big aha moment is recognizing that they have value and purpose mm -hmm. and God has placed them on the earth to do something significant and to be part of stewarding his creation. And, you know, I think those are ideas we get so familiar with that we don't realize how transformative they are. If you've never been taught to think that way about your own life, that you have yeah. a why and a meaning and a purpose. And so those are really, I think, the two big ideas that Quorum Deo has helped us get across. But then I think the really fun ones are um, just the little anecdotal ways that it changes our students. So I remember years ago, um, I was in South Sudan with one of our students from Kenya. He was one of our very first students in the program. And I think we were just driving along the road. We were like in a van or something. And he told me like, before he would have always just thrown trash like out the window, like no thought about it. Mm -hmm. But after Quorum Deo, can't do that anymore. And I'm just like, that's, that's really cool. That's part of stewarding, you know, God's yeah. creation. And it yeah. makes me think of Bob Moffat, who I know he, he told me he used to walk and sing, this is my father's world and mm. pick up trash on his way into the office. And I think it's just cool how, you know, Bob Moffat here in the U S or our student in Kenya, like, you know, it awakens them just to kind of that stewardship mandate. And then um, in Haiti, I was there a couple years ago, and it was a class, probably about 30 students, one female, and then the rest were all males in this class. And they were talking about Quorum Deo, and I think the facilitator led it into some gender questions about how women are treated in Haitian mm -hmm. society and kind of raising that to these boys in the class. And it was really gripping and eye-opening, I think, for them just to realize, like, whoa, the status quo for women in our culture and the way we just, you know, give into that. And it's not, it's not dignified or healthy yeah. treatment all the time. And having that awakening was really powerful to see. And so I just, I love how like kind of like the Bible, it does its work in all kinds of ways that you right. don't expect. I feel like because Quorum Deo is scriptural truth, it has that same impact from 
you know, changing our relationship with Christ to all these little micro behaviors or thought patterns yeah. that it's, you know, unraveling in a healthy way. Right. And as you say, there's just different little anecdotal things because as you, as you work through any, as you work through scripture, you work through courses, maybe it's the 10th time you hear the phrase or the thought or the mm -hmm. teaching and you it finally, maybe it's the hundredth time, right? And it, mm -hmm the penny finally drops or, or you've seen it. Now you see it in the right light or from the right perspective. And it kind of, it opens that new space in your mind. Um, yeah. It's powerful. Yeah. I'm, I'm some of the stuff you're saying, even back to your last point you were making about, uh, you know, Anderson having this uh, computer science degree, but being excited about Coram Deo and, and how I, I, I think back to the analogy of, uh, you know, give a man a fish versus teach a man to fish. Right. And so there's some low level of giving man a fish. And then I would argue that uh, that the computer science degree is, is teaching a man to fish. Right. And so now he heck, he can go out and catch catch something every day. He knows how to do it. But then we like to take it one step further and teach them to think about fishing. Right. Yes. Where yes. should I be casting today? How do I do this sustainably? If I use this kind of bait, does it right? And then and now you're actually wielding the, the thing you've been given, the gift you've been given, you know, you're wielding it the way it's supposed to be wielded, yeah. right? You're yeah. plug, so you're plugging it in, you're plugging a computer science degree into God's plan. Yeah. Because you kind of see, you've taken even one step further back. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's something more recently that we've been trying to do more of. So we had these programs and things like entrepreneurship, web design, virtual assistant work. Um, but we realized recently we needed a new program to help them kind of take all the skills they've acquired and package them in a way that makes sense for their lifestyle, their skills, their personality. And so what that became was a freelancer boot camp that we started offering this year. And it's very much like you've described where we don't tell them like necessarily here, go, you know, apply for this job or take this exact course to, you know, improve your skills. We kind of give them a repository of, you know, here's a bunch of skills that are good for people who are going to be freelancers. Now go look at, you know, the courses where you feel like you're weak or where you could improve. And then um, it's really just a process of helping them think about finding their niche and what they'd mm. be good at. So, you know, they learn to do web design, they learn to do some coding, um, some graphic design, some digital marketing. So they have these basic technical skills, but then we want to help them go to the next level, not by saying, now we have, you know, advanced web design, but think about where you can best apply your skills. And then here are some ways that you can grow you know, in whatever skill area you feel led to pursue. Mm. So we have a student in South Africa right now, and um, he did our whole web design course, but really felt interested in graphic design afterwards. We don't offer an advanced graphic design course, but, you know, I was able to kind of point him towards some resources, and he's working on, you know, building his portfolio and profile and all that. And that makes me really excited when I yeah. see those students, because that's the sort of kind of self-sufficiency we want to cultivate. And really it, it's required in this sort of educational milieu we have online because mm -hmm. I don't want them to depend on us for what course do I take next or what are you going to teach me? I want them to think about what God has given them to steward and then realize there's this whole world. I can go learn from this Google course or I mm -hmm. can go take these coding courses or maybe it has nothing to do with technology, but um, we just want to introduce them to a new way of um, like learning how to learn on yeah, their own. Yeah. We, we, Coram Deo ends with the seed project, right? And, mm -hmm. and one of the criteria for that is w with what you have now, right? Yeah. With what you, and so maybe that's just a different way of, you can, you can extrapolate that to all of life, right? That's a different way of thinking about how you're applying mm -hmm. anything to any context. Exactly. What do I have? Okay. So now I have this, I now have this degree. Now I have this knowledge. What am I doing with it? Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do you mind if we take a couple of questions from, from the audience? No, not at all. Okay. Um, let's see. So 
uh, could you tell us what courses specifically you offer? You had mentioned five before. Is that kind of? I, I think that's about the right number. Okay. So, so for example, or maybe if you can run them all off. Yeah, yeah. So our flagship course is the digital boot camp. That's by and large been the most popular okay. pretty much everywhere we've worked. And um, that contains at six weeks, starts with some basic coding. So they kind of learn how to do computer programming, but not too much. And then it moves to graphic design. So they learn kind of how to develop marketing materials, posters, business cards, whatever they might need to be able to advertise their business online or in print. And then they move to web design. So I talked a little bit about how we really try to encourage kind of planning and organization and critical thinking as they think about developing their website. And then they'll actually build a, a live website. We host it for them and anybody can see it online. So that's kind of exciting for them that, you know, they have a real website that's out there on the internet. And then they finish with a digital marketing course from Google. So actually once they complete the digital bootcamp, they'll have a Google certificate in digital marketing and then they'll earn the Trinity certificate as well. Yeah. They'll have a, a live website that they built and then they'll have all the other skills with coding and graphic design too. So that's, yeah, our most popular one. And then we have a virtual assistant bootcamp and that's been really important working with Jamila at Work for a Living. She pretty much manages that program for us, does a lot of the evaluation and has worked with a lot of students. But that's a really big up and coming industry right now is people needing virtual assistants. Yeah. You can pretty much do that from anywhere, often any time zones. So it's good for, for people who are interested in, in that sort of work. And then we have an entrepreneurship boot camp that uses the lean startup method, which I, I just love because it's a very simple way to get feedback about your business idea before you spend a lot of money, before you feel like you have to raise capital or yeah. anything. And then you build a minimum viable product to prove if people will buy it or not. So it's a very simple way to approach entrepreneurship. And then we have a new program. It's a social media marketing bootcamp. So for people who want to do, um, yeah, social media video or um, graphics, that sort of thing, and teaching them how to, to become basic kind of advertisers on social media, either for their own business or to do that for somebody else. And then our final course is the freelancer bootcamp. So yes, we do have five right now. And uh, that just helps them kind of as a capstone once they've gotten some skills to figure out how to market those skills and begin to, to bring in work wow. from what they've learned. Great. So uh, if somebody watching now wants to do something like this in their country, mm -hmm. um, two things, how would they get in touch with you uh, and, and start coordinating? And two, um, what do you do with language barriers right now? So if we're in West Africa, we're mostly speaking French, what, yeah. what, what do you do there? Yeah. So if someone wants to get started, I don't know, Sean or someone in the Yeah, they'll be able to link that, it. Just put our website, trinityeducationglobal.org. And we have a, an application there where um, someone can just apply to be a new partner, facilitator, and then we'll, we'll get in touch with you and, and follow up. And our training process is pretty simple. It takes about eight weeks. So we have the local partner. They will nominate a facilitator or a group of facilitators that they want to be trained. So usually that's, um, you know, a, a teacher or somebody local who's available for, you know, part-time to be able to lead the program. And then we'll, we'll train them for free. And we have an online course that goes through um, everything from what is blended learning and kind of introducing them to online learning. They'll choose which boot camp they want to facilitate. So they'll actually go through that course so they know all the assignments and content and everything, earn their certificate just like a student would. And then they'll finish with um, preparing to facilitate Quorum Deo and then um, plan a budget for the program, um, plan some marketing materials and kind of their recruitment strategy. So it's almost like being um, kind of an educational entrepreneur in a way because they're more than teachers. We're actually preparing them to kind of launch and manage and run a, a sustainable a model. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then the other question was about language barrier. Mm -hmm. So a couple of years ago, it was um, with the church in Peru. I'm trying to blank on their name, but Pastor Alicia, mm -hmm. I think she's been to many of the DNA forums. Mm -hmm. They have a, a very large church. And so I went down and met with a team 
goodness, it was probably about 15 facilitators and we did everything translated, but just introducing them to kind of instructional design and biblical worldview integration. So they could start their own program in Spanish. So we kind of trained the leaders and then let it, let it go for them to develop the program. And we introduced them to some online content in Spanish because okay. just like in English, we have all these um, online course providers, the Spanish speaking world, the French speaking world, they have their own version too. So although we can't directly operate um, in a language besides English, we can point people to resources and we can train them how to kind of create, you know, an online program that's, that's similar. And then I love that Quorum Deo is in different languages. So we're working our partner on knows it. Week. Yeah. yeah, we have her like encourage her to use the Portuguese version. So we try to use resources that we know are good, you know, in other languages if they've been translated. But Great. yeah, that would be more of a consulting sort of role, not yeah. Ever. Here's the okay. program off the shelf that you can use. Right. Okay. So one more. Sure. Uh, I, th I don't know if Dwight's putting you on the spot here, but this comes from Dwight. Oh, he, uh, he said that you want to create a course specifically aimed uh, at sharing vocation and worldview with students. Yeah. Uh, kind of a life work, uh, maybe Monday church for youth. Is, is that something you're working on? Is that something you're doing? Well, we're not working on it yet. We just, Sean and Dwight and I just talked about this a couple of weeks ago. But oh, So I, his, his last question was, will you do that, Amanda? So I'm asking, maybe he's like, he wants the commitment right now. He maybe wants the commitment. You're live and he's waiting for it. That's, that's very classy. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, so what, what we're thinking and what I felt has been a need for Trinity for a while is a course to help people kind of discern their calling and vocation because one thing I struggle with is we have these, you know, very specific sorts of courses in social mm -hmm. media or web design, but not everybody's called or gifted, you know, to go into those areas. And so I would love if someday our pathway looked a little bit different instead of starting with those courses that we started with a foundational discern your calling, discern mm -hmm. your vocation sort of course. The freshman them. orientation course. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. So help them kind of figure out, you know, why am I here? How has God gifted me? And what does he want me to do next? And yeah. I think Sean was the one who said, you know, that just gives students an entirely different sort of motivation. Because when you know your why, you'll stick with things. Yeah. You know, if yeah. you're just like, I don't know, my friend recommended this course and I'm going to try it. It's very different. Yeah. So I yeah. think that's a huge need for us. I think it's something that could benefit the DNA too. And uh, yes, Dwight, I'm very, very interested. Uh -huh. And I will, I'd even say commit to helping with that because I think it's just so important. So we got her, out. Dwight. We got her. All right. Awesome. <laughs> we have a few more minutes. Do you have anything uh, that the listeners need to hear? Anything you'd mm -hmm. like to share in closing? Well, I, maybe this isn't for the listeners as much as just for you and everyone at the DNA, but we just love what you guys are doing. And at the end of the day, like every time it always comes back to Quorum Deo, you know, we, we want to make, you know, provide sustainable livelihoods for people and give them skills and give them vocational skills and things that they can use to support themselves and their families. But it always comes back to Quorum Deo. And we look at like, Lord, what are you doing through our work and kind of where's the greatest impact being had? It's Quorum Deo, and sometimes I wonder, it's like, maybe we just need to step back and encourage partners just to do Quorum Deo, and, um, you know, that's, that's really where we see the greatest impact happening, but at the same time, I think we're reaching a number of students who would never just take Quorum Deo, who if their church was offering it as a, a seminar or a small group, you wouldn't find them there, but because it's paired with this vocational skill aspect, you know, they, they get exposed to it and then they realize like, oh, that was actually the most important part of what I took away from the program. And I think it's very similar to work for a living and what, what Ina's doing where you don't lead with Quorum Deo or biblical worldview, but at the end, that's actually the most consequential thing that we're doing. So I'm just really thankful that you all are there and that you're continuing to dream and lean into the Lord for how I would have you continuing to offer programs and discipleship resources and more than just the content. I think the relationships, just the way you all give yourselves and your lives to, 
to listen and walk with the partners who are part of the DNA network. So thank you, because we couldn't do this without the DNA. Thanks, Amanda. But can I get a soli deo gloria on that too? Yes, that's Amen. right. Only because of the Lord and what he's allowed you to do. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, it was a very pleasant hour and an hour is never enough. I say it every week. Um, can I pray for you and for the ministry? I would greatly appreciate that. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll say goodbye. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today and your blessings. And thank you for our sister, Amanda, uh, just for the, the path she's been able to walk, Lord, that has led her here for the experience she has, the wisdom she's gathered, um, the relationships she's built, God, and the way that now you're using her to reach many, many people all over the world, God. Uh, we pray that, uh, as she was just sharing, Lord, that while they're, they're learning to provide for themselves and for their families and how to, to um, make a living, Lord, that they would also learn the most important truths, Lord, and that they would know you, God, and they would have a relationship with you um, and that they would apply these skills um, to the advancement of the kingdom, Lord, that they would uh, just uh, offer these, these talents uh, to you for your glory, God. Uh, and I just, I pray for Amanda. I pray for her family. I pray for her ministry, Lord, that you would bless her. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jeff. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you to Sean and Dwight, all the behind the scenes people who manage. Yeah, thank you. Comments and everything. If you uh, want to find out more about Trinity, I believe Sean has linked that. Give me the uh, full email, or the full web address one more time, please, Amanda. Uh, yep, trinityeducationglobal.org. Trinityeducationglobal.org. You can find out more about what they're doing. If you want to find out more about Disciple Nations or disciplenations.org, please check it out. And we talked a lot about Quorum Dale. That's free to you. You make a login and you're rolling. It's Quorum Dale dot com check it out thank you so much god bless and we will see you next week bye